Hello, everyone. My name is Yulia Gustava. I'm a, a professor of law and director of the FinTech and Blockchain program at Rutgers Law School. And on behalf of Rutgers Law School, I would like to welcome uh, Stefan Mugelin, a senior officer at the Financial Supervisory Authority of Germany, uh, BOTFIN, to Rutgers and to the FinTech program. And without further ado, uh, Stefan, please take it away. And it's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thank you. Same here. So, and uh, indeed, thank you for the invitation. And it's a pleasure to provide here yeah, uh, insights in our regulatory framework relating to crypto assets, in particular in the European Union, but also with a specific focus uh, on things we have implemented so far in Germany. So, if there is no further introductory remarks, so I would start my presentation and share screen. So I hope everyone can see my presentation. Okay, perfect. So then let's start. Um, so I try to um, introduce it as a mastering the complexity of crypto assets and the regulatory framework in one lesson. So just give it a try here to, to tackle all the complexities and characteristics uh, we have uh, with regard to crypto assets, but uh, also with a related um, regulatory framework applicable to those instruments. So first of all, uh, let me set the scene. So here's an overview of legislative initiatives we had in Europe and also in Germany. Um, and as you may see on the left-hand side, so it all started with a specific implementation or amending of the anti-money laundering directive. So where at first uh, in 2018, uh, crypto assets became some kind of uh, an interesting topic in the market, also with regards to financial stability, but also um, in terms of anti-money laundering and financing of terrorist activities. And therefore, there was an amending in our European uh, AML directive, which introduced uh, crypto assets initially as a uh, virtual currency, so as referred commonly used uh, in, the, in the past, so in the years 2018, 2019, and uh, also where for virtual currencies in particular, virtual currencies, uh, trading exchanges or platforms uh, were in scope or, or new in scope for uh, for the requirements uh, to, to be fulfilled uh, under the AML directive. And therefore, as you see, um, the proposal for the amendments were in May 2018, but it took a while to transpose them uh, also in international law. Maybe here, just as a side note, uh, European directives have to be implemented into national law. Um, so allowing uh, EU member states um, to adapt specific provisions um, in their respective um, perspective, so where they deemed it necessary to, um, in a given a scope, to, to implement um, the directive. On the other hand, they are also, and it is uh, the most commonly used uh, instrument, legislative instrument uh, for the time being, is an EU regulation. So that is directly uh, applicable uh, in the member states and to the supervised entities. So just as a background here, and therefore, uh, as you see here on the national level, um, on the lower side, um, the implementation of the changes from coming from the um, anti-money laundering directive took st still a while, so they were only transposed into national law uh, at the beginning of 2020. So uh, there were almost um, 18 months um, for this transposition to really ensure how it should be integrated. And here, uh, it is of importance that uh, as the uh, AML directive uh, is a European directive, um, there were different approaches used uh, here uh, between uh, or among. European member states, and therefore um, some only uh, transpose the AML directive by having some kind of registration requirement um, for firms providing specific services for uh, virtual currencies. And on the other hand, as for example, here in Germany, we introduced uh, crypto assets as a new type of financial instruments in our existing regulatory framework um, with a result that any type of banking or financial service provided in crypto assets um, have to be authorized before uh, before the provision and are part of the ongoing supervision by BaFin and also Deutsche Bundesbank. And um, yeah, as you may um, assume, so that uh, really have some impact here on a European level. There's some kind of competition between firms and, and where firms are established because there were different regimes uh, in the past um, by the implementation of the AML directive. 
So then um, maybe just one additional point here. So that is more from a political perspective um, in Germany, uh, the German government um, decided um, uh, and uh, approved a so-called blockchain strategy. So that really uh, had a broad focus where uh, blockchain may be some kind of new technology providing benefits um, to the the two businesses and new uh, types of firms like a fintech um, ecosystem and therefore there was a strategy to um, approve and, and foster new technologies uh, such as DLT or blockchain um, also in financial markets but also in other types of uh, business activities and uh, then uh, yeah, switching back to what is the most important thing here uh, over the years is um, the digital finance package uh, of the European Commission uh, which was proposed um, at the 21st of September in 2020. So that includes different legislative uh, proposals uh, such as Mika, so the, the most important regulatory framework in Europe regarding uh, services um, for crypto assets, but also in addition, uh, the so-called Digital Operational Resilience Act. So that is more focus on operational resilience and information and communication technology risk management uh, in authorized and supervised firms. and in addition, uh, coming back to DLT used in financial markets, the so-called DLT pilot regime, which is some kind of a regulatory sandbox um, for the use of distributed ledger technology uh, in financial markets with a focus on uh, the operation of a trading venue and the settlement of securities transactions, so resulting from these um, transactions from, from a trading venue. Uh, and as you see, so it was uh, the proposal was in September, and the application um, of one of the parts of it, um, of the so-called DLT pilot regime, uh, was last year in March. So um, there, it, the DLT pilot regime became applicable, and then we see first um, application files requesting for for an authorization um, under the pilot regime to provide these specific services. And also with regard to Mika, at least from a legal perspective, it entered into force um, last year in summer. Uh, but uh, as it is common sense uh, for, for most of the European um, legislative proposals, um, there's some kind of time gap between entry into force and the direct application. So there's often a um, specific uh, time period, like between months and years, uh, one uh, um, taking into account once the new provisions became applicable and therefore here uh, Mika is already entered into force but the provisions become only applicable um, this year in June starting with the provisions um, regarding stablecoin arrangements so there are different types introduced uh, in Mika and um, for the rest of the provisions under Mika um, application will be by, by the end of the year just to maybe uh, yeah, finish what we see on a national level. So in, uh, with regard to the blockchain strategy, there was uh, in summer 2021, uh, one legislative uh, initiative to introduce securities or electronic securities are issued in an, in an electronic way. So there are two different types possible. One is uh, issued in, in a central register operated by a so-called um, central security depositories. And when it comes to the blockchain strategy and, and the use of uh, DLT as an underlying infrastructure, um, the German Electronic Securities Act also allowed issuance for so-called crypto securities, where the register um, is operated or, or by use of a decentralized technical infrastructure. And um, yeah, the, uh, in, at the first step, um, this German Electronic Securities Act was limited to a specific type of instrument, so to bearer bonds uh, and unit in collective uh, investment undertakings, because um, as it was some kind of a new initiative, the idea was here to really open the regulatory framework um, only, only partially to where the impact might be lower than also uh, introducing at the first steps uh, and allowing uh, issuance uh, in an electronic form of shares for uh, for participation uh, in stock companies. But that uh, was then introduced uh, by end of the last year as part of the so-called German Future Financing Act. So uh, in this uh, legislative proposal, um, the German uh, government and legislator uh, also approved the extension of the scope of the German Electronic Securities Act to allow um, 
the issuance of electronic shares in the future. So to the background, why it is necessary and very important, uh, in particular for the German market. So I will um, outline later. So, but just to give you here an overview, uh, what had been done um, on on a legislative initiative. So um, that is what we have in European level, which also require uh, very often implementation into national law, at least when it comes to responsibilities uh, of BaFin uh, in becoming a supervisory authority or by amending the regulatory framework for specific services or additional requirements, addressing uh, also in particular here uh, specific characteristics of DLT um, or blockchain as an underlying infrastructure for assets or for the provision of services. Okay, so then uh, maybe what was the idea? So giving you some kind of a background, the idea of the EU digital finance package, in particular for the use of DLT in the financial sector. So as, as part of the digital finance package, the European legislator aimed to exploring, developing and promoting the use of new technologies, um, so such as DLT, because um, yeah, for, or it was for different reasons. So one was um, that there's some kind of business expectations uh, in terms of um, business developments uh, for existing uh, firms, but also from the fintech space. So that might really um, provide um, economic growth uh, within the European Union uh, and also allowing new technologies um, to really being used, uh, elaborated and, and developed uh, in the European Union. So really to keep uh, pace uh, from an, from an international competition perspective. So not, not maybe just uh, like in the past for traditional financial market infrastructures are uh, given in uh, in international competition, but also to other technologies uh, such as cloud, where uh, yeah uh, the main provider for the time being are located um, or providing their services um, at least on a top tier level um, from the United States. So in addition, um, the use of DLT in the financial sector requires um, some kind of regulators or supervisors to review uh, the potentially uh, to, uh, and to uh, potentially amend the administrative practices. So it, um, during the ongoing uh, work, also here by the implementation of the anti-money laundering directive in national law, uh, it became obvious, obvious that there is some kind of need to really elaborate how the existing um, supervisory practices uh, and standards uh, would be applicable um, for services and assets in supervision where the underlying infrastructure in particular for, for example, for the issuance or the transfer is um, at least partially decentralized uh, or there's a specific degree of uh, decentralized decentralization or distribution um, of functionality. So that is really what was some kind of new and where it is uh, acknowledged that there is some kind of uh, exchange between market participants, but also to, to learn and develop um, and amend um, supervisory practices, but also the regulatory framework. Yeah, as I already mentioned in the introduction and the overview, so there, uh, at the beginning there were different uh, supervisory and regulatory approaches, in particular for crypto assets uh, within and among EU member states. So that might be changed uh, when Mika will be applicable um, in summer here for for stable coins uh, at the beginning and then by the end of the year, because uh, as a regulation, it aims to really have an harmonized uh, approach here and to ensure convergence where also the European supervisory authorities like the ESMA or the EBA uh, then try to ensure uh, that there are convergence measures if needed uh, between uh, the approaches um, of national competent authorities um, in their supervisory responsibilities. Uh, and, and what I mentioned already is here what, what is really important when we have a look on crypto assets uh, and supervisory expectations, um, defining minimum standards uh, also for risk management. Uh, here, uh, digitiz digitization and in particular DLT or blockchain protocols um, not only requires a, a comprehensive assessment of the dependencies, but also of, of roles and responsibilities because now it has became more and more important to have a distinction between the technological infrastructure used for services and the financial service or products. Because um, as you might also be aware, there's often a discussion between operating permission-based systems, which then might be limiting um, the scope of services to specific 
entities or units uh, and the use of permissionless uh, blockchain protocols um, where there's a uh, yeah in general a global reach um, for use of this technology and then um, it requires a distinction if specific assets will be issued and transferred by use um, of this technology and also what is still part of a service so in particular uh, in terms of questions um, regarding outsourcing arrangements and the use um, of, of this technology still being part of a provided service which requires authorization and is and is in supervision or if it just still some kind of infrastructure technical layer which is used but which is not um, directly seen as a part of the financial service uh, of or of a product so that is really what we discuss uh, lengthy uh, not only among supervisors and regulators but also with the market participants to uh, really amend and uh, ensure adaptation of the existing regulatory framework. So maybe just uh, here to highlight some, some kind of a recommendation because crypto assets and digital assets could have a, a, re a really broad understanding. So a recommendation is here to refer or make use of existing definitions. There are some uh, which are uh, already agreed among uh, international standard setting uh, bodies, but uh, indeed there are also popping up uh, um, terms used in the past to really uh, then ensure the use of a specific crypto asset. So for example, um, cryptocurrencies is, is, is more and more used um, for blockchain native tokens, which, which, uh, uh, which are used uh, to pay fees uh, for the use of a protocol. Um, and, and that was what it all started with, with virtual currencies and cryptocurrencies, where uh, in particular central banks argued that is neither money uh, nor a currency. So therefore, the, there was a definition agreed to use crypto assets, um, but also uh, in a broader context um, of financial markets, um, there's often uh, the term used digital assets, but uh, digital assets could also be seen some kind of an electronic instrument where the ATO blockchains uh, doesn't have any specific function. Uh, and therefore there's some kind of reference to crypto uh, in the meaning of uh, relying or using cryptographical methods um, for the deployment or transfer um, and storage of of the, of the of the crypto asset on a blockchain protocol okay so then crypto assets in light of the german banking act so i i initially already provided some insights here so it all started with the transposition of the aml directive and uh, here is the german legislator and the supervisory authority decided to have a full scope implementation so not only requiring kyc uh, procedures uh, also for crypto asset service providers but uh, to really um, amend the definition of financial instrument in our main regulatory frameworks the so-called german banking act um, where banking services uh, and financial services are defined uh, which require authorization and then um, also will be an, an ongoing supervision uh, by BaFin and Deutsche Bundesbank. Uh, in addition, so what we see here uh, regarding the implementation of the European regulation for markets and crypto assets, so uh, MICA, um, we actually have a government draft uh, of the so-called German Financial Market uh, Digitization Act, which include a new supervisory or regulatory, uh, regulatory framework, um, the so-called German Crypto Markets Supervision Act, so that uh, uh, transpose the MICA regulation into national law. And here a uh, decision was taken to have a, a new type or a new framework. So it, it is not integrated anymore in the German Banking Act. So it is really a, a new regulatory framework uh, transposing and, and implementing a MICA and, and defining roles and responsibilities here for crypto asset uh, or crypto assets uh, and its supervision. And yeah, as I said, um, it is necessary to have a final uh, legislation here as Mika will be applicable um, uh, on 30th June uh, this year, uh, in particular for the provisions applicable to stable coins. And here is the two types are outlined. So there are asset reference tokens and e-money tokens, um, which um, can be issued uh, in the future under Mika and where specific provisions are applicable. So the details, we will have a look later. Then uh, just to give you a full picture uh, regarding also our supervisory approach here in Germany with regard to the German Banking Act. So as said, um, 
all the dots around here were a typical financial instrument, uh, well known within the financial market community, and with a, a transposition of the AML directive. So um, the German Banking Act was amended um, by a, an additional type of financial instrument, so the crypto assets. And, the, and then um, with, uh, the, as a result, um, any type of banking or financial services uh, in crypto assets um, became also uh, part of authorization requirements. Yeah, and maybe just um, as a side note here, because um, current legislation proposals are on the table uh, regarding the transposition uh, of, of MICA into national law. So the, as the term crypto assets is also defined in scope of MICA, um, the German Banking Act had to be amended and therefore the definition of crypto assets um, will be excluded. So that will become part of the new uh, regulatory framework. And what remains some kind of a residual size um, or based on the national definition uh, chosen for crypto assets in the past, um, will become cryptographical instruments uh, and therefore there, rem uh, there will remain some kind of specific uh, services in scope of the German Banking Act, uh, which then relates to uh, national services introduced uh, and um, closely linked uh, to national law, in particular to the issuance uh, of these electronic securities in accordance with the German Electronic Securities Act. So if there's any questions, so please feel free to step in because that's really some kind of uh, complex here, not only because um, it is European law and, and it requires um, an each and any step uh, transposition into national law, but that is really um, one of the approaches used uh, and um, that is the one we, we have here in Germany and in particular for with regard to services defined here on national level when it comes to safe custody of crypto assets or cryptographically keys to secure for example, electronic security. So that is really still complex here for experts uh, in Germany. So, so therefore, so uh, I would... Stefan, uh, thank you so much for this invitation because uh, even I uh, was getting a, a little bit confused. Um, so if I may, uh, financial instruments are regulated under MIFID, right? MIFID two, uh, And then a subtype of those financial instruments are in cryptographical form meaning they are electronic, such as tokenized shares of stock, for example. Am I right? Yes, it's a bit more complex here because, uh, as you said, and that is uh, absolutely true. So with regard to financial instruments, uh, uh, well-known or applicable within financial um, um, or for financial markets, so that is MIFID. <laughs> so that is also a European directive, but that um, slightly differ from what we have in the German Banking Act because that is a national law. Um, regulating um, in particular banking services and financial mm -hmm. services and therefore uh, as you see here uh, in in mifid there's a, one of the types of financial instruments is transferable securities mm -hmm. and there we would assume that it is uh, bonds and shares but here in the german banking act you see uh, point one is shares uh, and then point three is debt instruments so that is still uh, or, or is already a distinction in comparison to the mifid term so i will provide you a slide uh, later where I have all these different type of instruments and the interaction to the regulatory framework. And indeed, in particular, um, as this Electronic Securities Act um, is a national civil law, uh, law uh, is a national civil law for the issuance um, of electronic securities, um, which can be used uh, on a blockchain or um, issued and transferred on a blockchain. Um, there's a national financial service introduced uh, which is safekeeping of cryptographical keys um, for right. access to these electronic securities. So that is really um, in, specificity in, in, in Germany, uh, where, because other do not have uh, this register function under the German security sect. So who performs the custodial functions? Uh, would it be banks under the uh, German Banking Act? Yes, indeed. So that is what, what um, um, so um, the... Um, the, the custody of cryptographic keys is uh, subordinated to the deposit function of, of a bank. So um, typically banks operating or providing um, the custody services for right. financial instrument. And that would include uh, safekeeping um, of the cryptographic keys for such securities. Yeah. Got it. Thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you.
So uh, yeah, and, and indeed that is really uh, on, also on a national level and, and we have it for years now uh, still a part of discussions because what uh, authorization um, is required or what covers specific um, functionalities or services here uh, and, and therefore yeah, uh, I welcome your question. So that maybe just to, to go as uh, one step back to, to show you what we had. So um, uh, here on top, we have the definition which then we used uh, within the European Union for crypto assets. So that is really a broad one. Uh, that means a digital representation of a value or of a right that is able to be transferred or stored electronically using distributed ledger technology or similar technology. Um, and, and maybe um, I would stop here and, and, and uh, go on the right hand side. So where the exemption is, so Mika um, also is only uh, applicable for type of crypto assets that uh, qualify um, that does not already qualify as a financial instrument uh, in the meaning of MIFID. So then MIFID would still be applicable and and. Um, this type of instruments uh, also if they make use of cryptographical functionalities or DLT would no longer be uh, in scope of MECAR. So that is this is one of the main um, important distinctions here. And we had this discussion um, over in the past. So what type of instrument is a MIFID instrument, in particular transferable securities, uh, and would um, already be in scope of MIFID if, if, if services are provided. Um, and the second one is here, um, coming back to the definition, we introduced in the past uh, in our uh, German Banking Act as national regulatory framework. So the crypto asset here um, is, and that is already limited to the meaning of that law, is a digital representation of a value, which is neither issued by a central bank or public sector entity nor guaranteed. So that is um, also some kind of linked um, to what uh, the euro system and the ECB uh, said uh, in the past uh, as stable coins and in particular Bitcoin become part of a discussion. So they said that this type of instrument are neither money uh, or a currency because uh, in the past it was uh, initially referred to virtual currencies. And therefore um, here we decided to have also this uh, distinction um, within the definition uh, and which does not qualify as currency as money, but it is accepted uh, by nature or legal persons as a means of payment. So that was accepted that it could be used as a means of payment or exchange. Uh, and what was in addition um, to really yeah, ensure focus of supervisory functionalities or, or the scope here is that there is some kind of an investment purpose in it and it is transferred, stored, or traded electronically. So. Typically, some kind of utility tokens were out of scope, so um, where you can make use um, by the token to uh, uh, in exchange um, to, for a service or, or something else. So that was out of scope. But um, if such instrument um, had mainly an investment purpose, so it, it would also be in scope uh, here for supervisory uh, requirements um, within Germany, because that would then be uh, in the mandate of BaFin, because then uh, if it is some kind of investment or speculation, so it would make sense or it would be comparable to other types of financial instruments. So, um, Stefan, may I ask for a clarification here? So, under the German Banking Act, the definition of a crypto asset, which is used for investment purposes, would not be uh, under uh, MIFID and financial regulation, uh, let's say, for securities, etc. It's an asset such as the utility token or Ethereum or whatever could still be used for investment purposes, but it won't be under uh, MIFID and the regulation um, promulgated under MIFID. Am I right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, then there would be another um, some kind of a test. So if this instrument would fulfill um, yes, the criteria uh, in particular of uh, transferable securities because the other types of financial instruments are really um, yeah, more focused like uh, derivatives, um, uh, like futures or, or options or CFDs uh, as contracts for difference and so on. But uh, discussions we had so far are really focused on, could it be that some kind of crypto asset is also a transferable security as part uh, of the MIFID definition as financial instrument? And uh, indeed, um, um, the main three criteria are, is, um, are is it divided into a similar unit so yes it is as part of a crypto asset then um, is it possible to trade it on a trading venue without the need that it, there's a trading effective yes it is uh, and the, the third criteria would be um, if uh, this instrument provides for yeah, security like um, rights like like a dividend or a redemption amount or interest payment so if that would be also uh, fulfilled 
then such an instrument would also be considered as a transferable security um, uh, in the meaning of MIFID. But that is some kind of the distinction. It, it could be similar as investment purpose. This is also a broad definition, but um, there are some guidance given by BARFIN that's a criteria for transferable securities uh, in the meaning of MIFID um, it would be or is most likely fulfilled by if all three criteria are fulfilled. So an asset uh, created uh, on some kind of blockchain could be either a crypto asset or uh, a transferable security or yes, other type that. of financial instrument. And a separate test would apply depending on whether it's tradable, uh, easily transferable, uh, pays dividends, et cetera, right? Yes, right. Okay, thank so, you. And, and, yeah, and in that sense, uh, that is a really a good question. So the European legislator decided also to amend the definition uh, of financial instruments in MIFID uh, by amending um, a, a link to including instrument issued on a DLT. So that was maybe not necessary because it was uh, before and the definition was technology neutral, but um, uh, also with the MIF MIFID, uh, it would be possible to have all these types uh, of financial instruments issued on a DLT, irrespective if they are a crypto asset under any other regulatory framework. So that was some kind of clarification where the commission thought it would be helpful to really allow or to to, uh, to provide um, clarification that it also includes instruments issued on DLT. Yeah, okay. So as said, so just as a follow up here, uh, but, uh, as a definition um, in Mika became applicable also uh, within Germany, um, um, as Mika beca uh, became applicable, so um, our definition within the German Banking Act um, will be changed to cryptographical instrument, just as a residual size um, for some kind of remaining instruments, which are not in scope of, of MIFID or any other definition, and, and also not in scope um, of Mika, where we have will have a, a, an own regulatory framework. Okay. So and that is uh, indeed here is the complexity uh, in particular from from a supervisory perspective. So what do we have? So we have in the middle the definition or the potentially crypto assets. So uh, using the, this broad definition and then maybe start here as you uh, already referred to Julia is, is a MIFID definition. So um, as the definition allows uh, issuance on a DLT. So that it would most likely also fulfill the definition of the crypto assets. But as MIFID is already applicable, it remains within the scope uh, and the merits of, of MIFID. And what we had um, for the distinction or supervisory classification of specific instruments being potentially a transferable securities in the meaning of MIFID, so that is here on the blue uh, uh, bubble, is, is, is the type transferable securities to generous. So that is an instrument which is from a civil law perspective not a security but it fulfills the, uh, but it fulfills the supervisory criteria and therefore is classified as a transferable security so that was often used by market participants uh, when it comes to uh, the open uh, to the public offering of such instruments where a securities prospectus is required and uh, such a prospectus has to be approved by barfin and and uh, in terms of transparency some issuer of such uh, tokens uh, yeah, requested approval and a classification of such instrument. And uh, then, if I remember correctly, in 2019, BaFin provided some uh, regulatory guidance um, on this criteria and definition. And therefore, these type of security-like instruments um, were established, uh, which are called here uh, commonly used as uh, transferable security sui generis. Um, then on the other hand side, so what really will come as crypto asset uh, under Mika is here, uh, stable coins. So that is one of the main uh, focus areas uh, why, um, why, why Mika was uh, suggested and what, where it is deemed necessary to have a regulatory framework. So the stable coins can be asset reference token. Uh, and what that mean uh, I, will I provide uh, a bit later. And also e-money token. So that is uh, typically uh, an e-money instrument we already have, but it is uh, issued and transferred by using a DLT or blockchain. Then in addition, uh, under MECAR, uh, there's also um, specific provisions for utility tokens. So in particular, when it comes to, to trading activities or public offerings, and then uh, and that is still under discussion. So what is really the scope here when it comes to non-fungible tokens? So there, in principle, uh, NFTs are not in scope of MECAR, but uh, there are some kind of um, 
yeah, recitals or clarification that if specific uh, characteristics are fulfilled of these tokens, so if they are similar uh, and, and or some kind um, of tranches uh, and, and, and therefore not being fully um, non-fungible, um, but more from a technical perspective. So it could be um, that they are within the scope of um, of Mika and uh, when there would be some kind of investment purpose, um, they could be still uh, part of the German Banking Act definition. So that depends then uh, if it has an agreement of the term cryptographical instruments. So that is still under negotiation, but um, that is the proposal here. What we then have, so as a, in addition to the MIFID um, criteria, so typical financial instruments, there was also a legislative proposal um, for the use of DLT in these financial uh, markets, so um, providing financial market services, so trading um, operations, trading venue and settlement. And here is a European um, legislator decided to limit the scope of the instrument. So, uh, and here these, there was a new term introduced. So the scope of the DLT pilot regime is for DLT financial instruments. So which are instruments under MIFID, but then limited to shares, units in collective investment undertakings and bonds um, to really yeah, limit the, the sandbox and potential financial stability risks resulting from, from the sandbox approach. And on the other hand here, what is remaining is a, so-called EWPG, the electronic, uh, the German Electronic Securities Act. So um, here we have crypto securities, which are really issued uh, by use uh, of DLT or blockchain as the underlying technology for the securities registrar. And in addition, uh, what is not governed by civil law, but 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 is part of an additional um, regulatory framework here for units in collective investment undertakings. Uh, here it was also allowed to have these units in electronic form because in the past, um, all these um, instruments, in particular bearer bonds and the units in collective investment undertakings still required uh, a paper certification. So in most cases, it is a global certificate for the issuance, which will then be uh, stored in a vault of, of a CSD or of a credit institution uh, and will be then transferred um, between um, between the owner. So that was in the past and, and uh, we, we were aware that in other jurisdiction, also in the European member states, um, there were already the possibility to issue such instruments uh, also from a civil law perspective in electronic form. So Stefan, may I ask you uh, a couple of questions? So the structure of uh, issuing securities and storing them in depositories will not change, right? Except that it will be electronic and on DLT. But there will be this global certificate somewhere in the vault, uh, and uh, um, owners of, let's say, shares of stock will have only beneficial uh, ownership. Am I right? So uh, it is slightly different. So uh, that remains. So there was no change that that become mandatory to have an electronic form issuance. Mm -hmm. So that is uh, uh, optional introduced. Um, but uh, in that case, um, there's no uh, there's no longer in a requirement for a global certificate. So in this particular okay. case where securities will be issued in electronic form, there's a requirement um, to provide the terms and conditions and, and um, specific mm -hmm. information on the issuance um, to the operator of, of the registrar. So there are two different types. One is centrally operated. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the other one uh, is also centrally operated, but may use of a DLT or blockchain um, for storing and transferring uh, the, uh, the information uh, of ownership. And, and that is really um, exclusively an electronic form. Uh, and uh, the crypto securities registrar uh, was introduced also as a new type of financial service, which require authorization because it was deemed necessary. Uh, and, and, and maybe just to pick it up here, I have a slide uh, on, on this later. The, this register function is really limited for recording ownership transfer. So there is no linkage to the money transfer. So there's no linkage or requirement for having delivery versus payment for, for transactions. It is really a register outlining or providing evidence uh, on the actual ownership uh, in this specific security. Question, and, and it, can, yeah, yeah. can a blockchain perform the same function? Uh, in, basically, can we remove the official register? 
which is a registered intermediary. Yes, this register, uh, uh, in particular for crypto securities, uh, can use um, for the operations uh, or for, for the technical infrastructure where this information will be stored or where, where transfer will take place, um, a distributed system, which was where the aim was to, to have it uh, here or mm -hmm. to address uh, market needs uh, for, block, for blockchain adoption. So that is really possible here. Uh, understood. And while we are on the slide, may I ask you about the uh, the DLT pilot regime. Um, so it covers the same types of financial instruments as MIFID does. How uh, would the company enter into this sandbox uh, instead of just following MIFID? Yes, a pilot regime is a, um, is a single regulation, so it is also applicable law, and uh, it outlines specific um, exemptions from traditional requirements under MIFID or the CSDR. So that is the regulation mm -hmm. um, for central securities depositories. Mm -hmm. So providing uh, or operating security settlement systems uh, on a top tier level and, and providing securities accounts. Um, and therefore here this uh, DLT pilot regimes um, outline specific exemptions um, uh, to really allow use uh, of various types of blockchain or DLT. And, and these exemptions then have to be uh, justified by the specific use of DLT. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and, and that can be requested uh, by, by an applicant. So that uh, you, one may only also choose to operate an MTF for DLT-based instrument still under MIFID, but if uh, the, the operator uh, deems it necessary or useful to apply for, for an exemption under the pilot regime. So for example, um, under the pilot regime for the operation of a, a multilateral trading facility, it is possible uh, to provide access to, to natural persons, so without having an intermediary. Mm -hmm. So that is different to MIFID and MIFIR, uh, and that is one of the exemptions. And the second exemptions for the operation of an MTF is um, with regard to reporting requirements. So um, the idea was that DLT provides some more insights, maybe a centralized mm -hmm. operated systems, and therefore, uh, the pilot regime includes an exemption uh, from uh, from regulatory reporting requirements where the NCA can then access uh, information um, directly by the uh, by the applicant or by the operator or uh, getting access to the uh, blockchain uh, data which is uh, stored or part of of a deployed smart contract or whatever will be part of of the system operated understood thank you okay perfect so yeah, uh, so that is the scope of uh, of crypto assets where it could be have an impact and where uh, regulatory frameworks would be applicable. So and, and as said, here's a clear distinction. So uh, if it already qualifies as a financial instrument under MIFID, so we are no longer uh, uh, in the application of MICAR. So uh, maybe just here uh, to to briefly outline what the pilot regime uh, uh, is. So uh, it allows for for at least or. Uh, um, in total for three different services, but uh, the main used service is, is a combination of, of the two, um, which are part of traditional regulatory frameworks. So on the left-hand side, so this operation of a multilateral trading facility, which is then operated by use of DLT. And here it is really uh, open uh, to what extent DLT is used. Yeah, it could be that there is some kind of order book smart contract, really full implementation, but it could also be that the MTF operator make uh, use of DLT only for specific parts of services or of technological infrastructure. And here the, the idea is that uh, MIFID would uh, be still be applicable and that the applicant could request exemptions which are outlined under the pilot regime and will then be authorized in addition um, to the operation of an MTF. Uh, and uh, for any exemption uh, which is requested, uh, there uh, is uh, some kind of a need for compensatory measure. So, uh, so that's a supervisory goal uh, is still achieved. Uh, and the same holds true on the other hand. So that is for a typical set operation of settlement systems. So here, the pilot regime also allows the operation of a DATSS. So that is a settlement system. Um, and here we have the application of CSDR requirements uh, plus the exemptions uh, requested from CSDR. And here uh, there are more, far more uh, exemptions outlined uh, in the pilot regime because most of the uh, of um, yeah 
challenges uh, with regard to the application of DLT is used on the settlement side. So issuance and settlement uh, typically take place in security settlement systems. And if that will be based uh, on a DLT system, so um, there are far more exemptions needed or required uh, under the CSDR because it already starts with the definition of a system, uh, which is a contractual arrangement between an operator and, and a specific number of participants in a written form. So that uh, already would not qualify for specific terms of DLT infrastructure uh, or blockchain protocols. So because there could, there's, it is not possible to have a written agreement uh, on the operation. And uh, it then uh, it follows up like, for example, that there is a reference to securities accounts and uh, it is not yet, or it is discussed if um, from a supervisory perspective, the securities accounts are equivalent to wallets provided on a blockchain. So therefore there are quite uh, a number of exemptions outlined and which can be used um, if justified by, by the use of DLT. Yeah, and then what, what is uh, also new because uh, in particular, CSDs are, um, services are limited to, to typically CSD services. So um, they are not allowed to provide additional services. And here the pilot regime as a sandbox allows the operation of a settlement system plus the trading um, platform. So that is really new and that is called here, unfortunately, like DLT TSS or trading and settlement system. And, and it really extend um, the scope of operations for CSD operating such a DLT system because then such a company um, is also allowed to, to provide trading um, a trading facility here for uh, in the securities and all at the same time provide settlement services. So Stefan, I hate to interrupt you because uh, we don't have uh, much time left. Uh, ne nevertheless, uh, just to summarize everything, uh, a trading platform under the uh, pilot regime will be able to operate both a trading platform, like an exchange, plus a settlement system, uh, such as uh, a regular securities depository or a clearinghouse, all together in one yes. entity. Absolutely. And uh, the registration uh, required for this will be under the pilot regime, won't it? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. So yeah, yeah. Having a look uh, at the time, so I just maybe outline here what is in Mika because that is uh, in particular um, also still under discussion. So uh, as you may know, so European uh, directives and regulations uh, as a level one text um, includes most often mandates uh, to provide uh, or um, develop level two or level three um, measures. So that are uh, regulatory technical standards uh, which are adopted by the Commission. Um, or, and level three uh, instruments, which are, for example, Q and A's or additional guidance. So details are really clarified uh, only on, on level three uh, and level two. Uh, but uh, to outline what the scope of Mika is, and here maybe as an introductory remark, Mika is some kind of a, a, like, like the MIFID provisions adopted to the characteristics of crypto assets and crypto asset markets. So as you see here, uh, what is in scope uh, of Mika? So there's an offer to the public of crypto assets. So that is similar to prospectuses requirements for transferable securities, uh, similar uh, as to admission to trading on a trading venue. So that we also have here prospectuses requirements for securities for the uh, for trading on a regulated market uh, under MIFID. Uh, and then it comes uh, to here what is you know, one of the main scopes here: authorization requirements. So any crypto asset service provider covering one of the services uh, outlined below. Um, requires an authorization. So there's also a light regime for, for credit institutions, uh, investment firms providing such services because they are already in scope of supervisory uh, frameworks. And, and what is important here maybe to outline briefly that uh, here are specific requirements for the for issue of scale, stable coins. So there are two different types, asset reference tokens and e-money tokens. And maybe in an international context. So what is here of importance or mandatory is that these stable coins can be exchanged uh, into Euro or, or, or cash at any time um, at power value, meaning so one stable coin uh, for one Euro. Uh, so that is really mandatory requirement. And the second one, which is uh, actually uh, yeah, some kind of part of criticism and discussion is that uh, under Mika, stable coins uh, could not provide interest payments uh, to the um, to holder of e-money. So uh, under the given uh, circumstances, so it is really interesting for the issuer to issue some kind of e-money because they can then make use of, of the money uh, or of the asset uh, used as, as a reserve to gain interest. But uh, Mika does not allow to, to provide this interest to the owner. And that uh, is 
um, at least possible in other uh, jurisdictions outside the European Union. So that is uh, heavily under discussion for the time being. And if such a, a stablecoin becomes significant, so for the European market, so meaning in terms of financial stability risk, uh, then um, they can be classified um, as such uh, and become then part um, of an oversight framework where no longer the NCA is responsible, but uh, um, if I remember correctly, the European Banking Authority will, will then be responsible because that is a part of the significance. And then also the ECB and the Euro system became a specific role because then it comes to um, also to uh, discussions uh, at least for, for the operations of uh, payment infrastructure systems. Um, yeah, and then also it includes uh, uh, specific requirements to the safekeeping of client crypto assets. So that is typically what we, we are well known is that there is an asset in the account segregation between own uh, funds or in, uh, instruments and the uh, instruments and assets uh, of clients uh, so that they could not be commingled or used by, by the operator or the service provider uh, for other purposes uh, as provided by the client. And uh, Mika also includes uh, provisions uh, on the prevention and prohibition of market abuse. So that is also similar what we know on the market abuse regulation, like um, the prevention of uh, insider trading, wash trades, and so on. So that is also well known. Yeah. And also the type of, of uh, services are yeah most likely similar to what, what we know uh, from from the typical banking and financial services and, and then includes so what is challenging for supervisors uh, is the use of these cryptographical uh, methods and also how specific blockchain protocols uh, work and their functionalities because then it uh, yeah it became of utmost importance here in, in supervision of uh, of risks management okay so uh, maybe just just to outline uh, what is maybe uh, of importance uh, in addition uh, to Mika. So um, Mika is often referred to or seen as a spearheading framework. So providing legal certainty uh, and ensuring advantages as one of the first of its kind regulation here in Europe uh, in an from an international perspective. But uh, Mika as any other um, regulation um, referred to in today's uh, seminar, it is all supervisory law. So that really uh, does not provide any additional legal certainty uh, when it comes to the classification um, of a crypto asset uh, in terms of uh, of private or, or civil law. So that is really uh, open and under discussion also uh, here in Germany, but also on an international perspective, how crypto assets can be classified uh, and how um, a civil law uh, yeah, provisions can can be adapted or implemented as maybe a new type of instrument or right um, and therefore Mika uh, Nisa addresses uh, such open questions about the status or classification uh, nor the reduction or reduce of potential risk so uh, if there are, or if there is a provision uh, in services and these services are supervised um, that does not prevent an investor in particular also financial institutions uh, from a risk assessment or from risks of the uncertainty of the legal nature of that instrument. So that, because there are two different types of, of shoes here. So yes, there is supervision in uh, in the services and, and there's some kind of also investor protection. But um, nevertheless, if I get some, or if I invest in such a, an instrument, um, it is still uncertain um, what it is in uh, in my jurisdiction. So in particular, how I, it can be transferred or who is the owner uh, or what is, uh, will be part in, in insolvency proceedings. And therefore, um, yeah, it is maybe not that legal certainty uh, as provided because it's limited um, to supervisory law. And, and here I, I would uh, open the floor for any other questions, but also thank you for your for your patience and interest. Stefan, thank you so much. And the last point you made was very interesting. I thought that, uh, so what is a crypto asset? Is it, for example, property? under German law, uh, or is it some kind of special type of property? Um, and in the UK, uh, there are projects regarding that um, in, in the United States, the UCC uh, is being amended accordingly. These are very interesting questions. So let me um, ask you this. Do we have um, a general European regime for trading, for settlements, etc.? which is being slowly implemented by the states, uh, the member states within the EU, but the foundations uh, of crypto assets are 
still not there to the extent that private law is yet uh, has yet to catch up? Yes, I would say so. So, uh, uh, for example, in Germany, we try to address at least for transferable securities with the German Securities Act one specific type. So, really uh, ensuring that uh, this type of crypto asset, as it would also fulfill the definition, is from a similar perspective a security, really uh, under a specific uh, foundation and the regime, so governing uh, these uh, rights on the securities. But uh, what we see and, and what is often discussed also as uh, in the context of tokenization, so that it, for the last months, I, I really uh, often read articles about real world asset tokenization. So and I wonder what, what that should be, because um, we have here, for example, um, also investment opportunities uh, in old timer vehicles. So uh, where you can have a token as part of, of this uh, old timer vehicle, but uh, it is required here to have ownership in a car to be uh, also have a paper certificate uh, authorized by a specific uh, administrative um, uh, entity. So and therefore, uh, this token uh, could not represent uh, any type of ownership. So the same is true on the discussion. So um, if there are, if there are tokens uh, available um, as representation of gold, yeah, so they can, mm -hmm. can be traded. But it could I uh, could such a token be a representation um, really as a partial ownership? Of a physical good, so that is still questionable, uh, and and for many of these cases, uh, there I, I I assume that uh, they are still, um, yeah, lacking the the legal foundation. So um, because most of these types, so where a, a new instrument uh, as a digital representation of a physical good is issued, uh, that could be seen some kind as a as a security because uh, it provides some kind of return on the on the given amount because mm -hmm. i have to pay uh, money to the issuer and uh, at least uh, the issuer provides um, the right uh, for for a repayment and a given date or following uh, termination or cancellation and uh, the remaining rights uh, or the potential increase uh, of value is just because it is potentially being traded and someone pays another price but the rights attached are most likely similar to, to a security but this instrument do not qualify as a security if, for example, if they are not not issued uh, under the German Securities Act. So, so we see uh, indeed some some uh, market um, issuance uh, as part of these sui generis, which really copy the requirements under our German Securities Act, but they do not apply that um, act uh, as as being governing for this instrument, and therefore it, is, it does not qualify as a security. That, Does that, that make sense to you? Yeah. Be, uh, well, hardly, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a very interesting point, which shows that some parts of the law are developing much faster than others. Um, so let me uh, uh, open uh, the floor uh, to very uh, short discussion, because we started a few minutes late, and uh, with your permission, Stefan, uh, let, let's take a question or two. Any questions from the audience? Please use the raise hand function uh, or uh, just uh, uh, unmute your uh, mics. Because I do have a question, but I don't want to usurp uh, the conversation. So, uh, Stefan, let me ask you this. Um, uh, th there is some concern, uh, especially among uh, U.S. regulators and some academics, uh, uh, that the DLT doesn't have that many use cases. Uh, do you see uh, use cases in Europe? Uh, I know that Deutsche Börse uh, is developing certain DLT-based uh, projects, et cetera. Uh, do, do you see the future for this technology? And uh, shall we invest uh, so many regulatory and uh, legislative resources uh, uh, into uh, these new technologies? Yes, yeah, so indeed, uh, what we see and what is also part of the international work is um, the the phenomenon of tokenization. So, uh, so that is really um, also uh, so part of uh, press releases by by many financial firms actually. Uh, and I, I would assume that there are potentials uh, here if um, and that really comes back to the underlying uh, infrastructure as a backbone for for transfer of instruments because. Mm -hmm. um, it would be, or it, from my perspective, um, it would make sense to have uh, here 
um, uh, tokenized instruments as smart contracts, which allow uh, increased uh, automatic uh, processes. So in particular, when it comes to interest calculation for the transfer or use, uh, because actually, uh, and you already um, in the US and Canada, uh, there are um, steps for, for the trading, uh, for the settlement cycle uh, to be shortened mm -hmm. to T plus one. Uh, we typically have here in, in Europe T plus two. On the other hand, um, the DLT, uh, so it's often provided or claimed that one of the uh, advantages is atomic settlement. Mm -hmm. uh, that would make sense uh, on a single uh, transaction uh, mm -hmm. between two investors. But when it comes to the implementation for financial institution and financial markets, so then uh, liquidity efficiency steps in. So uh, there are, I recently wrote an article about liquidity efficiency um, uh, measures here to, to really not having atomic settlement, but uh, uh, to, to have some kind of molecular settlement. So picking up specific transactions together to uh, increase efficiency. But uh, if both sides, so financial instruments and also uh, the, the cash side, uh, is based on DLT. So that is uh, the second part we see. So uh, the wholesale CBDC discussion, uh, then there might be uh, advantages for the for the use of DLT because then interaction of these instruments uh, seen as a as a digital object, which, which can be predefined, uh, would then make uh, uh, things really smarter. So not meaning that it, is, it would make more sense, but uh, that they can interact between and that, can, that in particular Cash flows can can be um, can be forecasted because there are data uh, available uh, which can be used uh, based on the underlying infrastructure and and uh, what we see here so that there is some kind of focus on permissionless public blockchains because it is uh, otherwise there is limited scope uh, and then we see um, uh, yeah really how is it called um, cooperation so. Putting competition back uh, and agree on a predefined technological infrastructure being used uh, or developed on DLT, and then having competition between uh, financial uh, institutions uh, on the instrument or service level, so which make use of the predefined or standardized uh, infrastructure. And then it would also make sense because uh, that would allow interoperability between uh, institutions. So it, it would make sense, but uh, my focus uh, indeed is here on financial markets, but uh, that is what we see among these uh, links of CSDs operating uh, different systems requiring um, standard international communication standards. So that could be solved uh, by a new type of infrastructure where interaction might be, be, be faster at for the time being. Mm 